Okay, well, we have a packed agenda, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome. My name is Paige Picorni. I am a program manager with No Kid Hungry, um, and I'm so excited to welcome you today to our webinar, Adding After School Meals to Your Back to School Plans. And this is a part of No Kid Hungry's Back to School webinar series. Um, I believe the last one, actually, so um, we'll be sure to show you how to get access to all of the previous webinars. Just a few housekeeping notes. The webinar is being recorded and the slide deck will be shared along with any resources to attendees and registrants via email after the call. Uh, we'll also have time at the end of the presentation for questions. So, and we want to hear from you. So please be sure to add any questions you have to the Q&A box. And I actually have a lot of questions already from the registration questions. So thank you all for those who put your questions in ahead of time. We have closed captioning available on this webinar. Um, so if you have uh, technology or accessibility issues, you can always mention a message, share our strength. Um, and that is Chelsea on the back end who can help you with navigating any of those. We also encourage you to use the chat box throughout the session to engage with each other and the speakers. Uh, there's a variety of people on the call and we wanna know who you are. So if you have a moment, um, open up that chat box and share um, your name, your organization and where you're logging in from. So today, um, after some brief uh, introductions, um, I am gonna give a really fast, really brief overview of the CACFP at-risk after school meals program. Um, and this is just a taste. Um, and I promise um, we'll answer more throughout the webinar. And also we can always have follow-up conversations after as well. And then I'm going to hand it over to our fantastic set of panelists. First, you'll hear from Danielle Bach from Greeley School District in Colorado. Then you'll hear from Mary Rose Bonas from Shelby Public Schools in Michigan, and Jeremy Rose, who is an out of school time meals champion from Missouri. And then after that, we'll hear from you uh, with, through that Q&A. So again, as you're hearing these presentations, feel free to use the Q&A box to put in your questions for the end of the session. Next slide. So if you're new to us, welcome. No Kid Hungry is a campaign of Share Our Strength. We are committed to ending childhood hunger in the United States by helping launch and improve programs that give kids the food they need to thrive. And I sit on our Center for Best Practices team, and we provide information, tools, and resources designed to end childhood hunger. And that's our website there with so much information, um, all great stuff, so do take a look. So the after school meals program, the CACFP at risk after school meals is the long way to call it, but it is a component of the child and adult care food program. So you may be familiar with this program, say if you've had any exposure to Head Start programs um, or adult daycares. Um, this is administered by state agencies and that differs from state to state, similar to uh, school nutrition programs, it might be in the education department or the Department of Agriculture. So um, usually it just takes a quick Google to figure out where it lies in your state. It supports both schools and community-based programs. So um, unlike maybe the National School Lunch Program, it can be administered by both um, school food authorities and also nonprofit sponsors. Um, Unlike say summer meals, an enrichment activity must be offered in, um, in uh, paired with the after school meal. However, participation in the activity, say the tutoring session is not required for a student to receive a meal. It just needs to be offered and available to everyone. It is available in areas where at least half of students are eligible for free or reduced price meals, known as area eligibility, similar to the summer meals program. And it's open to all kids 18 and under, regardless if they participate in the enrichment activity again. So um, as long as the school or location is area eligible, you can offer meals to uh, any kid who shows up. The after school meal program helps in many ways. First, it offers a healthy meal when school lets out on weekends and over school breaks. So unlike say the school, school lunch program, it can actually be used on weekends and say Christmas break or um, spring break. 
It helps improve end of day behavior, focus and performance and provides needed energy for after school activities and learning. And last but definitely not least, it supports children and families facing food insecurity um, and those who are not. Uh, groceries are expensive these days, I keep saying. <laughs> Next slide. How after school helps communities. So uh, it has a really um, decent reimbursement rate. So like other meal programs by USDA, it works on a reimbursement model. So um, schools or nonprofits will receive $4.33 per meal and $1.18 per meals per a dollar eighteen and eighteen cents per meal per snack, um, and that's the same rate for all students. Additional funding can help offset overhead costs, support equipment purchases or repairs, and maximize labor. The added service can also does build goodwill with parents and the community, um, knowing that this is, uh, schools or the nonprofits are a trusted resource to provide three meals a day for their students. Next slide. And why we're having this webinar is that just one in 12 kids from low-income households who receive a school lunch also receive an after-school meal. So I don't look at this as a failure. I look at this as an opportunity, an opportunity for growth to increase the reach of after-school meals across the nation and how we can help. Um, no Kid Hungry provides resources and educational materials, helps navigate applying for and implementing the program, highlights effective service models, and shares promising practices and grant opportunities. And we also have mentors and stakeholders um, in many states. So um, never hesitate to reach out to us. And that is our After School Meals webpage where you can find a lot of our great resources. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to our expert panel, and um, I would, I always hear requests for menu ideas, so um, kind of fun for this webinar today, as um, our speakers are introducing themselves, they're also going to share their students' favorite after school meal. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Danielle. Thanks, Paige. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, I feel like your question is a little bit of a trick question for us because school just started. So I don't know yet what their favorite thing is this year, but if I take myself back a couple of years um, prior to the pandemic, our cheese enchiladas were popular enough uh, that we sold a fair amount of adult meals because we would have whole families come and gather uh, and sit and eat family style for the cheese enchiladas. They were absolutely a, a fan favorite and I can't wait to get them back onto our menu again soon, I hope. Um, hi, everybody. A little bit about me. My name is Danielle Bach. I am the Director of Nutrition Services for Greeley Evans School District 6 in Greeley, Colorado. Uh, shout out to my friend from Sedgwick, a little further north than me, but uh, not that much. We are about an hour north of Denver, Colorado, uh, relatively large town, maybe a small city these days. I think our total population in the city is about 80,000. We have 23,000 students in our school district. We serve at 38 school locations, including every charter school uh, in our district, as well as a couple of private schools. 65% of the students that attend Greeley Evans School District 6 qualify for free or reduced meals. Uh, that puts us at a, at a pretty high rate of participation simply because we have so many kids living in houses that are experiencing poverty. When I think back to how we started, um, I can't forget this tiny slip of paper that I carried with me to interview for my now job as director. At the time, I was the coordinator of schools for Greeley, and I wrote down three things that I wanted to accomplish if I became the director. And the very first one on the list was supper. Uh, I find it to be relatively low hanging fruit. Now for all my other school nutrition professionals, and it seems as though Michigan has sent a quite a contingent um, for the state agencies, we know that administratively it can be a bit of a lift. Um, we're talking separate applications and separate claims. And if your state is like mine, separate state agencies. CACFP is operated by the Department of Public Health and Environment, Paige, you didn't mention that one, so you can add that to your list uh, here in Colorado. But in 2016, when I became the director, uh, I realized the opportunity that we had to ensure that more of our students 
were going home with full bellies um, and hopefully then coming back ready to learn the next day with full bellies. So we implemented CACFP at risk after school meals in 2017. And in 2017, we had five sites. Um, I think that year we served just under 10,000 suppers total for the school year. Um, as of right now, we are in our seventh week of school here in Colorado, and we are currently operating 24 after school at risk supper programs. Um, my new friend Jeremy will talk about a super snack, hopefully. Um, we go into the after school programs and we meet with those program coordinators and those principals, and we talk about what it is that students are going to be doing during this time and the length of time they're spending at school after the rest of the kids go home. And, and as it turns out, more often than not, uh, a supper is a better option than a snack. But in addition to our 24 supper sites, we're also operating six snack sites. Um, so we really are trying to reach as many kids with as much nutritious food as we possibly can throughout their school day. Um, the way we do that is that I do webinars like this. <laughs> I talk to as many people as I possibly can uh, throughout our community. And hopefully I'm able to share a message with the folks that are in our community that if their students are attending a school district, our school district or a charter school in our school district, that they don't need to be hungry after school. That if they're participating in an after school program, anything from the chess club to the football team, um, we are more than happy to provide them with that nutritious meal. And so we started off simply by partnering with our own principals who were planning after school study sessions and credit recovery courses. Uh, that quickly led me to attend several of the meetings for our athletic department um, to discover that team meals uh, were a great opportunity. And so in several of our high schools, we operate a supper program that is served by the football team uh, and then enjoyed family style with the football team. And I got to tell you, for those underclassmen who are aspiring to become more involved at their high school, that's a real win to sit down and have a meal um, after an upperclassman quarterback has served you a spaghetti dinner uh, and get to hear all about how this meal benefits their performance on the field. Um, so a great natural partnership. If you are looking at schools, talk to the athletic department, talk to those, those ADs in the school, the athletic directors. Um, they want your chocolate milk. It starts there. And then, and I say chocolate milk is the gateway um, to the athletic department. Once they find out that you make meatballs from scratch and you're serving fresh marinara that's fortified with all kinds of vegetables that we make from scratch in our kitchen, um, they, they very quickly realize that they are going to win more football games when they eat supper together. Another really great opportunity to partner in your school's and in your after school community programs, I also noticed a lot of uh, Boys and Girls Club programs here with us today, um, is exactly that. Go find your Boys and Girls Club. And if you don't have a Boys and Girls Club specifically in your area, find that rec center or that community center or that library uh, that brings kids in at the end of the school day. We do a partnership with our library system and when they do community readings and they have guests, come in to read from a recently published book, we will provide a cold sack meal. Um, and that's a really great opportunity just to make sure that we are staying present with our kids. And the great thing is we have that meal pattern. And so for those that are already operating this, you know that these are the most nutritious meals that a kid will have. Uh, during their day. That is, that's not just me preaching to the choir. Those are, there's some good studies. Paige might be able to Google that fast enough. Otherwise I'll get it up there while Jeremy's talking. Um, studies have been done that these are the most nutritious meals that our students can eat. Um, and so getting a third chance in the day to provide one of those is always going to be a winner. Um, I want to just use the last couple of minutes that I have to share with you guys some of the tips that I have, if you are thinking of starting a after-school at-risk supper program or even an after-school snack program, the first tip that I have for you is find somebody 
not too far away from you. I'm pretty sure Sedgwick is a good solid hour, maybe hour and a half drive, but you come on down and see me if you want to. Find somebody nearby, reach out to them, cold call that director or that program coordinator and ask them if you can come see it. Nothing will get you past the challenges, the administrative, dare I say burden, but paperwork, menu planning and all the rest Nothing will get you past that hurdle faster than seeing kids enjoying that meal after their school day. So my first tip is go find somebody who's doing it and take a tour and ask them the questions that you have that are scaring you. The second tip that I have for you, if you are already operating a meal program, use what you have. Um, menu something again. A lot of my kids get something in their lunch that may be repeated on a supper menu cycle. We just try to make sure that it's not ever the same day or even really the same week. But utilize those products because that will help you keep that inventory turn going and that rotation of fresh food coming in. Um, lastly, my tip for you is to find a champion. Find a champion in the program, in the school, at the rec center, at the library, at the park, wherever you're doing it, find a parent, find a teacher, find a retiree that cares about kids and wants to give back. Because if you can find that champ to tell the good story of the program that you're operating, it will alleviate the majority of the work you have to do as an operator. Now, all you need to do is find the food, make the food, and get the food there. Um, more often than not, what we see is an overwhelming amount of community support and folks willing to pitch in and volunteer. And so a lot of times with these after-school programs, if you are a school food service operator, finding staff to work them is your biggest challenge. We start our day at 4, 4.30 in the morning, and nobody wants to be there at 4.30 in the afternoon. So if you can find that champion to gather community volunteers, you can't fail with this program. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Paige. And I just want to say thank you to No Kid Hungry and Share Our Strength um, for bringing us together and providing us the opportunity to share what we're doing out there. Thanks, Paige. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I'm excited to start an after-school meal program, and I'm not even a school food service director. Um, with that, we'll pass it over to Mary Rose. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, uh, my name is Mary Rose Vanis and uh, I'm the food service director for a small rural district in Western Michigan called Shelby Public Schools. We have uh, probably about 1400 students in our buildings over uh, a radius of maybe 15 miles. So the challenges that we have are a little bit different to what my colleagues would have in that um, logistics of feeding a small number of children in each area is what, what, what we're most challenged with. The county that we live in, our, our actual free and re reduced rate in our elementary school is 82%. So it's, uh, we qualify for the CEP program, which is a community eligibility program for all kids in all grades to get free food throughout the day. Um, we're in Oceana County, which is the second poorest county in the state of Michigan. And if you look at the mitten, which is, I somebody told me this when I came here, we're about here. And Lake Michigan is here. So during the winter, uh, we're like, um, we're like, uh, to get to us is like traversing against, uh, through uh, the um, Antarctic. <laughs> um, so, it, it, it's the getting the food to us. I came to the USA in 2007 and was the food service director at the American Youth Foundation before I came here. The camp 
which was close to Shelby School District called Camp Minnewonka. And they had children receiving a snack like supper in the after school. And they approached the camp to see if they would be able to uh, do the hot supper. And they asked me if I thought I'd be able to do it. And I've been doing school food since I was very young. Uh, in, an, in Ireland, and then I came here. What, what challenges we had was getting it up off the ground. So we did, we actually cooked the food at the camp and brought it to the school district so that the kids in the after school program could have a hot meal. Um, I, that's not to knock anyone giving a cold meal, it's not at all. What it is, is, is law, some of our students are going home very late at night and their parents maybe are on second shift. So they're not getting any hot food until their parents are home. Um, so that is how it all started. I actually didn't work for the district. I worked for the American Youth Foundation. And um, very soon after that, the, the uh, director left and went to another district and I was asked if I would be interested in the plan for the job. And that's how you guys all got me. <laughs> so um, being a child raised in poverty, I empathize with how important our role is in caring for the students. Like when they come to school in the morning, and they go home maybe at five or six at night. We, we are the people who take care of them. And for some of the students, the food that they're getting at school is the only food that they're going to receive in the whole day. So it's important that we... we uh, I, I like the school district to uh, the school cafeteria, the school meals, the school food community to be part of the whole school community and not just to be set you know we see the kids at lunch time we see the kids at breakfast breakfast time is to build the relationship with the students and with their teaching staff we feed our students and they have I, I want them to go into a restaurant for example I you I didn't answer your question I'm apologize for that but if you cook curry in a school in Western Michigan where they, they have never had anything like curry uh, and the, the smell and the aroma of that, it goes throughout the school, then the children will ask about it, talk about it, open conversations about it. So that, that was one of my favorite was the curry night when we had curry and we had 50% of the kids took the curry but about 80% of the kids who took it liked it. So they, they, they trust the food service people. They trust that we're not going to food, serve them something that, that is not good. So the curry would be my best night. But I would like the students and staff to have an expectation of high quality meals when they go anywhere, not just because it's free that they get, get given anything that I want them there's a high rate of poverty. The kids are not from affluent families and we, I want them to be able to go to college and be able to say, well, I've tried that before, but I didn't really like it, but I might try it again, rather than it just be pizza every day. We don't offer pizza every day. What, what we did is our model is a scratch cooking model. And when I initially started, my co-workers were on five to five and a half hours each. Now they're all on seven and a half to eight hours each because we cook the food, majority of the food rather than buying the processed food. It's good for the community and it's good for the quality of food. And if you're, you can get the buy-in from your local public and your school administration is excellent. We actually work with um, 
we do about 400 after school meals in a district of 1400 kids, which is like not far off a third of the students. We have 93% participation in our breakfast and lunch programs. Uh, during COVID pandemic, um, we were uh, in a situation where we couldn't get anybody to come to the West of Michigan to our small districts with the USDA food to farm to family and food boxes. They wanted uh, they want to be able to drop two truckloads. And when you're small, dealing with small districts, you need to uh, you need to you know we only need five cases, not fifty five cases. So um, on I phoned the USDA and they said, "Well, ask them what they want." Ask them what they, what they want you to do. So I did, and they told me they needed me to take two truckloads. So I approached No Kid Hungry, believe it or not. <laughs> and they uh, supported us with a grant. So the way the reason I'm saying this now in this form is that thinking outside the box and asking for things, you, you don't know if someone's going to say no until you ask them to say no. So if you need a piece of equipment or you need something, approach No Kid Hungry or Gen, Gen Youth or you'll have to play 60. There's lots of grants out there that, to help you get equipment. And anyway, during the COVID pandemic, we became a hub then for the West of Michigan and all the food banks, churches, schools, different districts and counties came and picked up what they needed from Shelby schools. And we were able to store it um, because I just phoned the factory, which is neighboring the school and asked them if we could have some help. And they gave us two reefers to store all the food in for the duration of the pandemic for two and a half years. And that we eat their apples. I don't know if you get Michigan apples wherever you are, but that we eat their apples every day. So I was talking about the enrichment for the after school program. What we have done in the past is we have let the kids do fundraisers where they will bake pies. Or we did, we got a grant from one of our local community organizations for the children to be able to um, make, a, a learn to cook tea. And what we did in that program was we bought food from where we could from local farmers and the local grocery store and we made a menu. And the process was that we cooked the food with the kids in school. And then at the end of that, they got the equipment they needed to go home and cook that food with their family. So those are just some enrichment ideas, but I'm going to mention the athletic department as well, but Danielle mentioned that the, the athletic department is, they love us because our kids need to be fed before they come to practice. So um, as I mentioned before, we endeavored to work closely with the whole school community, but we also work with uh, community organizations that have youth groups and we become the sponsor for their food and we bring them, we deliver their food to them. I, I always laugh when the children, they, uh, I call my lasagna Irish lasagna because I make it slightly different than you guys. And um, the kids will build up a relationship and a rapport with you. And they might even try some real Irish food when they go out to the restaurants. What I would do also is what Daniel suggested is I would reach out to, to other directors in your area. Make yourself visible. I mean, I really, really make myself visible. And I, I'm an introverted heart. But uh, if it's for the good of our children, I, I will talk if I need to. Um, we work with our local farmers. This year, in fact, our local farmers approached us 
now when we want to, or when they have product that they need help with getting rid of, they, they will sell it to us, and usually a, a, an attractive price that makes it worth our while. And the farmers like it, it gives them good publicity when you're taking photographs and they get their face on Facebook. Well, I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Rose. Great tips and tricks, um, and what a great story. Um, so I'm going to pass it over now to Jeremy Hahn, and I'm excited about this um, trio of panelists because Jeremy is actually going to talk from the nonprofit perspective, um, working with schools to implement after-school meals. So take it away, Jeremy. Thanks, Paige. Yep, uh, I started in CACFP and after school uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we launched a community center in what was an abandoned elementary school in the heart of Springfield, Missouri, a uh, large city in southwest Missouri, and uh, it was in a, a pretty rough neighborhood. And so as we got the our daycare started and started seeing kids come in for after school programming, uh, we really saw the desperate need uh, there. And of course, food had to be a part of what we're doing. Uh, it draws people and uh, and we we get to sit around and talk as we eat. And, um, <clears throat> and as we were getting into the program, we began to notice that a lot of the kids who were most hungry were the ones coming to us immediately following school. They weren't participating in after school programs and and uh, or, or sports. And so we we really wanted to make sure that they were getting a healthy meal or snack. So we called it started calling it a super snack and uh, and put together a, a nice sack that they could eat quickly as they got ready to go to their next thing. And uh, that eventually evolved into uh, actually our, our state auditor asking us as she would come in and do our, our reviews over our programs and have you ever considered taking your program rural? Uh, so we did. And um, I had the privilege of serving over 120 school districts, over 35,000 kids across those districts in Southern Missouri and our Arkansas, uh, which is uh, really exciting. But we get to work with all of the logistics involved in serving kids and that many school districts and bus schedules and after school uh, schedules. Uh, it, it became very interesting to juggle all of that. But what we found is that supper in the classroom was the best way for us to reach every child. Uh, we wanted to serve every child. Uh, we love the fact that we get to serve the football players before they run off to practice or, uh, or the kids staying for clubs. But most of the kids who go home to nothing are jumping on the school bus and arriving to an empty home. Uh, so we wanted to make sure we put something in their hands. So as soon as the school bell rings, we work with our school districts to serve everyone. And that's the challenge. Find a way to serve everyone. And as we speak with districts to expand, this is probably the number one pushback. Well, we can't find 15 minutes in our day. Uh, but it's a, it could be as simple as pushing the bus schedule 15 minutes. And uh, sometimes that may seem like a hurdle. But so far in all of those school districts, we have not heard a complaint by a parent on my, you know, the, the schedule changed 15 minutes this year. Uh, they, they haven't even noticed. Some may even appreciate it, I don't know, but um, but it it's that simple to find 15, a fifteen minute window so that we can serve kids and offer enrichment, and that's been the exciting part as this has grown, is we have uh, looked to. Um, offer enrichment to these kiddos in unique ways. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. I want to I want to speak on what what makes up our super snack uh, and, and super snack can be delivered to every classroom. It does not have to be difficult. Now I'm with Mary Rose. If you can get them a hot meal and something nourishing and you find that champion like Danielle mentioned that is willing to do that, go that route. That is the best, most nutritious meal you can get those kiddos. But for us, we work with a lot of small school districts, and they don't have that champion. They don't have the resources to do it. So we use pre-packaged, individually packaged items that are shelf stable for the most part. Um, and we've worked with a lot of distributors and manufacturers to make sure that we're meeting the guidelines. And I'm surprised how quickly manufacturers are willing to adjust uh, their packaging or their formulas so that it does line up with what the USDA requires. So our favorite uh, meal item 
is a chicken stick and it's like a beef jerky stick but made of chicken and uh what i love uh about that is we found a local uh, kind of a hobby business in one of these small towns little lockwood missouri just a couple hundred people live there but a gentleman was starting out his little hobby business of making these chicken sticks and uh, our food distributor said hey we're, we're carrying this new line let's go talk to this gentleman and uh, we did and he was willing to adjust his packaging his formulas for us and uh, he is now cranking out uh, one of those a week for our kiddos and they they keep asking can we have it every day of the week uh, but it's been uh, fun to see even him here's our, our local manufacturer grow from a hobby business out of the garage to now he is the largest employer in his town and we get to we get to help build business along with that and that's that's pretty exciting uh, so work with your distributors and manufacturers if you're looking for those unique or fun or appetizing uh, items uh, or or the packaging that will work so that you can put it in a bag and and that's how we do it our delivery system is that every classroom we have a count on the side of the tote and a a sack a lunch sack is packed with each of the food components and then delivered to the desk of each and every child uh, and this is a great way to incorporate other students in delivery uh, pick the leader for the day in our elementary schools especially kids kind of fight over who gets to deliver the afternoon snack uh, and so it's a it's a lot of fun to see how schools use something as simple as a snack to even build leadership. Um, but our enrichment, as we discuss uh, what enrichment you think, well, 15, 20 minutes, uh, that's that's all we have at the end of the day. Uh, number one, it's tough to find uh, in, a, in a packed school schedule, but it is worth the investment. Our schools who make the change and find the time uh, never complain at the back end. Uh, they, they may struggle each year as they're putting their calendar and their, their schedule together to where are we gonna find this? But each and every year they've come back and said it is worth doing it again. Uh, so find that time. And like I said, it could be as simple as pushing the bus schedule and, uh, and the pickup schedule. But it is certainly worth that time. And your teachers, too, uh, if, if we ever hear a complaint before we start a program, it's the teacher saying, I don't want to have the kids in my room another 15 minutes. And uh, we had one teacher especially vocal about that. But uh, I thought, oh, no, this is going to be kind of a tough start here at the school district. But about two weeks in, she came back and said, oh, my goodness, this is the most valuable time of my day. I love that extra 15, 20 minutes with my kids. They're eating their snack. We're just talking about life. I feel like they know them on a whole new level because I'm not having to worry about clicking off my agenda. Um, so it, it is certainly worth that investment. And curriculum, we've used some pretty basic curriculum, but exciting about healthy choices and uh, character traits and building character. So think about the things that kids may not be learning as a part of their regular curriculum. And uh, you can create this. There are a lot of great resources out there. No Kid Hungry, I believe. And uh, USDA also has some great resources for enrichment. Uh, but primarily what, what we focus enrichment on is building relationships with uh, teachers to kids or kid, peer to peer. Uh, that has just been amazing to see how kids can start to interact uh, in a different way when they have these few minutes at the end of the day. Uh, some of our teachers use it for open Q&A time, questions that kids didn't get to ask uh, through the day. Uh, or the tutoring time, I think Mary Rose mentioned, um, it, it can be so helpful just those few extra minutes before kiddos go home. And so it is the super snack and, and even parents who may say, well, I'm feeding my kids dinner at home, you know, you're feeding every child in the classroom. This is a super snack. It's, uh, you still have room for a meal at home if, if your family does that. But what we get excited about are these kiddos who, uh, who may be don't wouldn't have that opportunity at home here is that third meal of the day they're not going to bed hungry they have something to tide them over till we can be with them again the next day in school um, so thank you uh Paige, for letting me share and uh, i'm excited to see this program expand and it's it's just amazing to see what a healthy meal uh in the hands of a kid can do to change their life Amazing. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, 
but a fantastic panel. Um, now uh, we get to chat with them more uh, with some Q&A. So if you haven't already, um, please do start putting in those questions in the Q&A box. Um, and I'll ask our um, speakers to come back on camera. Um, so the first question I have, um, I'll direct first to Danielle, but others feel free to chime in. Um, was a question about your football team meals. Uh, and if you could just describe a little bit more about when they're offered, or are they offered every day or um, during the um, just game days? And then a follow up to that, we had a lot of questions in the registration list um, about tips for high school. So this is a great segue. If you could chat a little bit about the football program and then any tips you have for high school programs. For sure. So um, let's start with the, the first high school program that we got up and running was not dedicated specifically for athletics. Um, it was going on in one of our yeah, high schools. Got no help for Walker. And, and our athletic director found out about it and said, hey, can my players eat supper um, with this group? And I said, of course, everyone is welcome to eat supper with this group. Um, it was after that, that the football team, actually, it was really the students, to be totally honest, the football players took ownership of this. And they really saw it as an opportunity to give back to the, to the um, underclassmen who were there working on credit recovery. If memory serves me, it was a math recovery credit class that started. It was definitely something on the academic side that no kid would be excited to stay and do after school. Um, and therefore, we wanted to provide them the best possible, you know, hook to stay, which was at that time hot food. Full disclosure to everyone, um, I have not yet returned to hot family style suppers in our district um, post pandemic. Uh, simply a staffing and food safety issue at this point. Um, it's very, very difficult to get community volunteers, as Jeremy said, to do the hot, um, hot suppers. So that was how we started it. Um, I'll let anybody else chime in and, and then I could maybe give some more tips about high school. So I'll add this then. Um, now that we are doing cold, uh, cold meals, sack meals, uh, it really helps to spread the word about what's in those sack meals. Um, get, get the things in there that they love. I don't know about this chicken stick or how I get this chicken stick, but it sounds like that to me, as soon as I heard it, I went, yeah, that do that. Um, one of our favorite now supper items that we're serving is a knockoff on the KFC chicken bowl. I don't even know if they still have these, but does everybody remember the mashed potatoes and the popcorn chicken and the corn and the gravy? We do one of those ourselves. We make it from scratch with scratch made potatoes and, and we package it and put it into a, into a bowl. Um, and when we advertise to our high schools that Major Taters Bowl, which is its name, Major Taters Bowl is served in supper, our participation for that supper doubles. So pick out the thing that your high schoolers love to eat and they will eat it at supper as well, is my advice. Great advice. Um, this question um, goes to Jeremy. Um, there's some curious curiosity around like the free reduced rates. Obviously, they're about 50%. Um, but if you'd elaborate a little bit more on that. And then do you notice any stigma um, around um, serving supper in the classroom to all kids and those who, maybe kids who are taking the, the uh, super snack, but others who aren't? Yeah, so of course, free and reduced lunch rate is over 50%, but uh, many, many of our schools are uh, over 90, and even we have a few that are 100% free and reduced lunch rate, which is uh, just astonishing. But when you're working with rural school districts, uh, you see much, almost, almost every rural school district we look at qualifying qualifies. Uh, so you get out of the city, and uh, a lot of times there are high poverty rates. Um, and it, that, that's part of why we serve every child was to get rid of the stigma. It's, it's just like math homework. You're all getting it. <laughs> Here comes the, the super snack, you know, the bag at the end of each day. And we'll play games. Uh, matter of fact, we have a, uh, it's a plum organics product. 
uh, that, that's just fantastic. It's kind of a super smoothie. Unfortunately, some of the packaging comes with a baby face on it. So we had a little issue selling that to high schoolers and even elementary kids. So we, we started on our Instagram, a little competition between football teams on downing their plum super smoothies. And uh, it just made it a lot of fun. And now all of a sudden that went from one of the items they didn't want to eat to now one of the most popular. So it's really all in how you package it and kind of sell it to the kids. Uh, but serving every kid removed the stigma around who takes it. Great. We have a couple more minutes. So I'm calling all questions. Definitely put those in the Q&A box. Um, a question for Danielle about your family style programs. How does that work? I was just typing that. So um, when we were doing uh, congregate feeding, uh, so when everybody was coming to the cafeterias to eat, and again, we are not so far this school year, fingers crossed we get back to it as soon as we can. Uh, but when we were doing that, that congregate feeding in the cafeteria, we did a pretty heavy ad campaign, um, you know, just on social media, didn't spend any money on it, but shared with our families that adults could eat for 350. And so the tagline that we were using was family of six eats for six bucks. So four kids, two adults, sorry, seven bucks. My math is out the window. They put me in charge of this. Uh, so we really were encouraging families to come in and pick up their students if they were able from the after school program. Um, sadly, as is true in school districts everywhere in this country, uh, bus drivers are hard to find and at a premium. And we often are not able to provide transportation for that after school program. And so families were coming to pick their kids up. So we said, come 15 minutes early. We opened up the cafeteria, we put out the hot bar, and we just brought parents through the line just like we would students during a regular school day. And so really it was not as much a family style offering as you might see in a, in a preschool classroom, as much as it was family style that families would come through, get their tray. We do serve full salad bars in all of our cafeterias. So that really is more of a, of a family style. Um, and they would sit down and they would eat together. Uh, and it really did help build community with our school and with our families getting engaged. The principals tell me that where we were doing that, we had better parent engagement um, in student, in just in, in a student's activity during the school day. Um, Walter, I hope that got to your question specifically. I love that, I have all the warm and fuzzies. <laughs> All right. So this question goes to anyone and a few of you are few of you are all of you feel free to chime in. But do you have any tips for transitioning from a snack to a supper in a school? Um, and this can be either from under CACF snack to supper or those schools where maybe are doing NSLP snacks. Any, any transition we have experienced in school districts we've worked with, uh, they have been serving, a few were serving the snack and then we took over with the supper uh, program. And uh, since it's packaged as a super snack for us, uh, it's the meal, the full meal, but uh, packaged more as a snack, there were really, really wasn't much of a transition. And, and since the nonprofit took the work off of the school district, uh, it, it made the work that much easier logistically for the school district. Um, but certainly I could see um, as we moved from, uh, we had changed some of our packing procedures. Uh, the more food items in a bag uh, certainly adds some labor and some hours needed there. So there, there are things to consider if you're going to add more components to what kids are receiving. But um, a snack to supper really isn't a, a huge transition. I don't, I didn't feel anyway, at least how we're serving it. I would agree, especially when we talk about sort of the, the super snack. Um, when you look at the, the meal pattern for, for CACFP supper, or when you look back at the, um, the components, you're not talking a significant amount more of food. Um, the greatest part is that you're able to offer students more nutrition because of that reimbursement. The reimbursement is, you know, close to four times. And, and in a snack, there's not really, quite frankly, $1.18 is not sufficient to provide any form of protein except in the milk. Um, so you're really just talking about grains and a milk. 
when you're doing the snack program. Um, I actually have had just recently the experience of the other direction where we were doing supper and we had program coordinators coming to us and asking us to do a snack instead simply because of the time that students were present. And, and originally we pushed back pretty hard on that and said, no, we want to provide students with as much nutrition as possible. But then when we sat down and talked to them and actually went out to the school and observed the program, um, a, a program that releases at 415 when school gets out at 330, really didn't need a supper. Um, they really just wanted to have that snack. So we, we made sure to make both of those available to our site sponsors to best fit their program. We actually called ours a, a snupper. <laughs> so uh, they at one point we got they got snack and supper. So uh, got to be that we felt it was too much or they felt it was too much for the elementary kids. So we renamed it snupper. And uh, they, they uh, we transitioned with, I will say, we used those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And um, the, the, the kids really enjoyed that. They enjoy pizza. They enjoy pizza when we make it um, because they only get it once a week. <laughs> and the, the, They'll try mostly anything now, but the, we transitioned through it being like a, a sandwich and a cold, and then we went on a grilled cheese and we got to our meatball subs and things like that. Snuffer, I'm stealing that one, Mary Rose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we um, have to give you time for one more question. So I'll ask that. And then I'm going to ask all of you all to share um, kind of that any last piece of advice you have for um, a school about to or a nonprofit about to endeavor on this project. So um, think about that. Um, and in the meantime, think about this question. Um, and just if you could elaborate a little bit more about the enrichment types. So we've heard a lot about athletic programs, but just a, if anyone from USD on a, is on a call, you cannot just serve athletes. Um, there has to be some other overarching opportunity, enrichment opportunity besides competitive athletics. Um, so if your school does that, what are those types of overarching activities. And then Jeremy, if um, you could share maybe what um, one of the activities in your sack lunches look like, or sack, uh, super snacks looks like. So what we do is that we we actually did the cooking with teens where we got them to cook. Um, we have the librarians actually work until 4.15, 4.30. So they offer the students the opportunity to go into the library after they've at their snupper and then we also have an after school program which runs monday through thursday and they have the opportunity to go to that as well uh i so i would like um my answer to i'm going to combine those two page for you because um after two plus years of a uh, global pandemic, there is not a student left in the K-12 system in this country who doesn't need more of something. Um, more math, more literature, more language arts, more, dare I say, athletics, gym, physical education, cooking classes. So um, my advice and our opportunity is to um, find that, that passionate human or teacher that wants to provide that because our students are facing um, a pretty, pretty severe deficit, a learning deficit from the two years that were, whether they were in school or learning remotely, the reality is it was a, it was a trying time for everyone. And and nobody felt that more than our kids. Our kids took on all of their own anxiety and all of ours as adults. So um, food, like Jeremy said, what it, it's the best possible way to make people feel comfortable and welcome and belong. So um, that, that recovery time for whatever it is, 
whatever the enrichment happens to be, our kids need it right now. And there's somebody locally in your area that needs that. And the best way to get it to them is to provide them with a meal uh, and allow them the opportunity to feel full and then, and then engage in that, whatever, you know, whatever the opportunity is. That's good. I want to join Danielle's team. <laughs> so We're hiring. Good. Let me pick a link oh, in yeah. there. <laughs> oh, yeah. For for us, we we have that fifteen plus minute window for teachers, and we don't want teachers to have to think of something else. Uh, Five thousand plus now uh, on our rosters for staff, so we, we're not asking them to create something else, or we will not be their favorite. Um, so for our high schoolers, we simply include in uh, their their super snack bags a conversation card, and we encourage them to talk with each other. And the conversation cards will include a question of the day, a few brief facts, and then we give a YouTube link as well. So some of our teachers even throw that up on their uh, their screens, and the whole class watches the the short YouTube video, just five minutes, which gets discussion started. And that can be about healthy choices or uh, addictions or other difficult conversations that uh, students need to be having, but maybe doesn't pop up in normal curriculum. Um, and then for our uh, middle school and elementary kids, we polled all of our teachers to ask what they wanted most. And they asked for guided reading. So we have recruited from our local hospitals nurses uh, to come in each and every week, and we buy tens of thousands of books, and they come in and tab each book with different uh, aspects of the book that, that kids need to be looking for uh, that are age appropriate. Teachers rave about this. So they, they love materials to be able to read to their kids. And, uh, and it's as simple as our team packing each week. They throw a new book in for each classroom. Uh, so those kids in the last 15 minutes, if the kids are old enough, the teacher will assign a kiddo to read out loud to the entire class. Uh, and if not, the teacher will lead it. But uh, that has been one of our most popular enrichment pieces. Great. Okay, so um, Danielle, you had your last piece of resounding advice. Um, Jeremy, your last piece for the group. Just do it. Jump in, <laughs> serve kids. There may you can come up with all kinds of reasons why not to, uh, but just make it happen. I think it is the big thing. And yes, you'll stumble and it'll be a little messy at first, uh, but the benefit to those kids who need it most is well worth the investment. Great. And Mary Rose, any last piece of advice? Well, I I think the. I remember what, back in 1976 when I was 10, there was an electricity strike in Belfast and there was no food for school lunch or breakfast. And uh, Mrs. Dobbin went next door to the supermarket and she bought bread and ham and Kit Kat. And I come from a family of nine children I'd never had Kit Kat in my life. Mm -hmm. So we, we plan and we make all these ideas and really what we need, what, what we are doing is for that one child who's never had Kit Kat in their life. It's, it's a mission. And all the lunch ladies, because this year the lunch, lunch lady was called Mrs. Dobbin. We got a teacher this year called Mrs. Dobbin. And I was like, oh my goodness, she's following me in her afterlife. <laughs> so that, that is what we are here for the children. And if we don't do it for the children, nobody's going to do it for the children. Well said. Well, thank you all three of you so much. What an incredible webinar. We do have a few final slides to share um, with some resources from No Kid Hungry. Um, I'm not even going to talk through these. Chelsea, feel free to just zoom through so people can see. We have many toolkits, uh, one-pagers about increasing participation, um, 
rules and regulations. We, we cross um, all spheres of the child nutrition program. So um, the last thing I do want to mention, we do have a webinar on the 6th um, about uh, CEP and implementation. So feel free to check that out. Please do sign up for our newsletter. We can hear about all these webinars, grant opportunities, new resources um, at that link there and visit our website. Um, we do want to hear from you. Um, these webinars are for you, so we want to make sure they're valuable. So after exiting the webinar, a short survey will pop up. So take just you know one, two, three, five minutes to complete that for us. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, that is my email there. I'm always here as a resource um, and be happy to help in any way we can here at No Kid Hungry. I hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye. Cheerio. <laughs>